high school when you would take uh, different votes, which you thought people would end up being one day? Anybody remember that? Anybody, anybody get voted anything they wanted to be? Anybody get voted anything they didn't want to be? Anybody remember that? Hopefully nobody's been scarred by that. Yeah, I, I remember. Uh, I, I remember we, we had we had the uh, m most popular, most uh, most likely to succeed. Anybody get that one? Anybody remember that? Most likely to succeed. Some of you got most likely to succeed. Nice. Now you got to live up to that. Good luck, Brock. Uh, anybody? Uh, you know? A anybody get uh, most most likely to become famous? Anybody remember that one? Anybody get famous? Nice. Okay, I can see that. Yeah, I, I remember the the one that I wanted was. Uh, most likely to be like a professional athlete. Okay, that's the one I wanted. Didn't get it, but that's the one I wanted. And uh, I, I remember, I ended up, actually they ended up, I guess, voting me like, um, the, I guess the best leader. And I remember just listening like, okay, they're gonna say athlete, like athlete, cause that's what I wanna do, athlete, and then leader. And I was like, man, what a letdown. But now I look back and I'm like, okay, you know, that's, there, there's, you know, there's some positivity to that, but the guy who actually got the best athlete or the, the most likely to be a, a, a professional athlete, his name was Josh. And uh, Josh actually ended up, he could do a bunch of different sports, but Josh uh, was really, really good at baseball. And uh, Josh could throw in high school right around 94, which is pretty quick, right? And uh, pretty quick. Yeah, he's doing all right. He's doing all right. Uh, I'm not going to think at all about the Astros right now. God bless them. We're just going to pray for them. All right. How about that? We'll just, we'll just leave that there. But, but, uh, Josh was really, really good. And, uh, I, I remember I would go out there and play and, and Josh was in, in high school. I'd go out there and watch him. Baseball is probably one of my weaker sports, but, um, I'd watch Josh and literally every single time he would hit at least one home run every game. I mean, he was amazing. He could throw and he could hit, come on, dual threat. And I was like, man, I was, I was like a little jealous. I was like, man, I, I wish I could do that. Like, man, that's, that, that's amazing. And, and Josh went on uh, to, to college and he, he went to a baseball school and he had a great chance of making the majors. Except one day him and his coach got to like a little wrestle type deal. All right, anybody, anybody ever try wrestling your coach? Right, when you're in college, you know, some of you that are dads, you understand this. Uh, I have two daughters, so I guess I can't understand this because if they try to wrestle me, it's just disappointing. I'm, multiple levels, but for those that have boys, I'm sure you can you can appreciate this, right? You know, boys get to a certain age and they start thinking, what? I could take dad. Right? You remember that age? You thought you could take dad and you were wrong. Because <laughs> dad has a disability or something, I don't know. But, but Josh got to that point with his coach and uh, he thought I could take coach. And uh, he decided to try to take coach and he didn't take coach. In fact, the coach actually took him down and actually by accident snapped his arm, snapped his arm. And uh, it's really sad because he actually ended up suing the coach and that's not a fun thing to, to, to think about and that relationship was disaster. But when, when, when I was thinking about that, I was going, man, this guy, Josh, he had all the potential in the world to do something great. I mean, he was so awesome and he had that happen, that moment of just complete letdown. I don't know if there's a better example of of letdown. And I, and I share that with you because I really believe in my heart, and maybe I'm wrong, but I believe all of us to some degree on some level, we all want to do something great with our lives. You, are you with me? Do you want to do something great? I want to do something great with my life. I, I, I don't believe that God just put me here on this earth just to exist. I don't believe he put you on this earth just to simply exist. I think at some level in every one of us, we have this desire to want to be great and to do something great. And oftentimes something happens to kind of mess that up. <laughs> you know, uh, some people call it life. Some people call it hopefully not marriage, right? <laughs> we want to, you know, but, but you, you, you go back and you think when you're a little younger, we had all these big dreams. Remember that? Huge dreams. We're going to do all this, you know, we're going to, and then you get your first job, right? And then you start, just things become monotonous. And, and all of a sudden these, these dreams that we had, whether it was being a professional athlete, being the, you know, whatever, most popular, most likely to succeed, those just become kind of memories. And as I was praying this last week, the reason I share that with you is because there's no doubt in my mind, God has called us as a church to do something great. No doubt in my mind. There's no doubt in my mind that God has called every single one of you to do something great. We were put on this earth to do great things. And even though we may have had some bumps in the road, even though we may have uh, maybe forgotten some things, 
that doesn't mean that we still can't do something great. Today we're actually going to look at a guy in the Bible, his name's Gideon, who God had set him up. God had a plan for his life to do great things, but he didn't see it the same way. He didn't see himself as someone who was great, who could do great things. And, and what's interesting is when you look in the Bible, you see this all throughout, despite the choices we make, God still wants to work through us to do great things. Despite the, like, can we just say the dumb choices we make? Can we say it? Can we just call it what it is? Despite the choices we make sometimes that seem to derail us from these dreams and these great things that we believe we can do, we still serve a God who's there for us and that wants to help us still do great things. So today we're going to learn from, from, from Gideon. And uh, I want to share this. This will be a little, little bit of a different message because as I was, I've been praying over the last probably three, four weeks about this. The Lord's been speaking to my heart, um, and this would be what I probably call a little more of a vision type message. And I want to share with you some of the things the Lord's been downloading in me. And again, you know, I, I've, I've been praying over this over the last several weeks, and I want to make sure it is from the Lord. And oftentimes, a great way to know something is from the Lord is to continue to pray about it. And then if you hear the same thing over and over and over, that's usually a good sign, right? So, uh, and, and, and that's what I've done. And as we get into Gideon's life, I think there's a connection, not only with just Gideon himself, but what God wants to do in this church. God wants to do great things in this church. So we're gonna, we're gonna open this together. We're gonna look at this. We'll have the, the words on the screen. This is a shorter story. I'm not gonna give you the full version. But I mean, I, there's, some, there's some such some great things in here. This is found in Judges, so we'll just read some of the story together. But check this out. It says this. It doesn't open very positive. It says, the people of Israel did what the Lord considered evil. Not a great choice. So the Lord handed them over to Midian for seven years. Interesting. God didn't do anything specifically negative to them. He just allowed the fruit of their choices to be manifested. So Midian's power was too strong for Israel. And the Israelites made hiding places in the mountains, caves, mountain strongholds to protect themselves from Midian. They're running. Whenever, Midian plant, or whenever Israel planted crops, Midian, Amalek, and Kadim came and damaged the crops. Nothing was working out. You ever notice that? When you're not following God, things just don't seem to work out. It's interesting. Verse 4 says this, that the enemy used to camp on the land and destroy the crops all the way to Gaza. And they left nothing for Israel to live on. Not one sheep, cow, or even donkey. Not even a donkey. Like swarms of locusts, they came with their livestock and their tents. They and their camels could not be counted. Wow. They came into the land only to ruin it. So the Israelites became very poor because, Midian, because of Midian and cried out to the Lord for help. Isn't that interesting? In other words, Israel makes bad decisions. And God says, okay. I make bad decisions, I'll give you the fruit of those bad decisions. It's interesting sometimes because sometimes we attribute negative things to God's character. God didn't do this to them. God just allowed the fruit of their choices to, to happen. So despite all that, despite them turning their backs on God, despite them doing exactly opposite what God wanted them to do, God is still loving and he's still caring. And look what happens. God loves the people so much. In verse 11 we pick up, here's what happens. The Lord's angel, who we believe uh, most theologians think that uh, the Lord's angel in this context was probably Jesus. So the Lord's angel comes to the village of Oprah. Okay? Village of Oprah. She pretty much does have a village, doesn't she now? She's got her own network. <laughs> and, and sat down the oak tree that belonged to Joash, a man under the clan of Abizir. And his son Gideon was threshing some wheat secretly in a wine press, so that the Midianites could not see him. Look at verse 12. The Lord's angel appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, brave and mighty man. Now just keep in mind, what did the Bible just say? He's doing it in secret. Yet the angel comes and says, You brave and mighty man. What's going on? Well, verse 13, Gideon said to him, If I may ask, sir, why has all of this happened to us, if the Lord is with us? You ever ask that? If God is really with me, then why has all this happened? It's a good question. He says this. What happened to all the wonderful things that our fathers told us the Lord used to do and how he brought them out of Egypt? The Lord has abandoned us 
and left us to the mercy of the Midianites. Wow. Strong statement. I don't know if I would say that if some random dude appeared to me. Okay? Now look at verse 14. Then the Lord ordered him, go with all your great strength and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. So this whole problem thing that Gideon just put back on, now Jesus says to him, you go do something about it. Anybody use that tactic for your kids? I love that tactic for my kids. It's great. Dad, this happened, and then this happened, and then, you know, I, I, it, it, was, it was her and it wasn't me. That's great. That's perfect. That's a perfect problem for you to solve. All right? And take a look. And take a look at what this says. Gideon replies after that. He could have said, yes, Lord. Yes, I'm excited. I'm going to be your chosen servant. Yes, this is a great challenge for me. No. Gideon's a wimp. Look at verse 15. It says this. Gideon replied, but Lord, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the tribe of Manasseh. And I am the least important member of my family. Excuses, excuses, excuses. Verse 16. The Lord answered, you can do it because I will help you. You will crush the Midianites as easily as if they were only one man. So much could be taken from this. But I think big picture, the idea is that despite Israel's bad decisions and choices, God still looks and he says, just because you have to reap the consequences of your decisions, I'm not going to abandon you. Do you know that God hasn't abandoned you today? Do you know that? You know, sometimes it feels like he has. Sometimes life feels lonely, but God hasn't abandoned you. And what's interesting is God wants to do something in Israel at this time. It's interesting because God doesn't have to. He could just let them reap the, 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 the actions or the, the results of their decisions. But yet he looks and says, I still want to do something great in Israel. And he looks to Gideon and he says, all right, Gideon, you're going to be my man. I love this because we have to remember even sometimes where when we may be going through hard times, God still loves us. He hasn't turned his back on us. And God looks to Gideon and he says, all right, Gideon, you're going to be the way that I work inside of Israel. Can I tell you this? This last week as I prayed, I believe the same way God wants, wanted to do something great in Israel. God wants to do something great in our city, in the city, I believe, of Dickinson. You know, when, when uh, Brittany and I first came here, we didn't know, I had actually, I have, I heard one person talk about the city of Dickinson. It's because Brit, one of Brittany's friends had some people that lived around here. But it's interesting because I came from, uh, I lived in Conroe for about seven and a half years or so. And, you, you know, you just hear things as you come down. You know, people will talk about Texas City, right? What do you, what do you think they said? Good things or bad things? <laughs> oh, I'm getting a lot of thumbs down. Oh, so sorry. Okay. Yeah, I, honestly, like when I'd say Texas City, people would give me a look. And I'd be like, what did Texas City do you? Like, come on now. All right. You know, I, I remember I came down and I, I would talk about, uh, I'd ask people like about, about Galveston. <laughs> and in some ways, like Galveston was like even worse, depending on who I talked to. It was just interesting. I was like, man, Galveston? People be, you know, they, they share about different crime things. Then all of a sudden, though, I talk about League City. And everybody's nose begins to go, oh, yes, League City. <laughs> you know, they all of a sudden pick up a, an accent or something, you know, naturally. <laughs> it's interesting, though. I would, and, then I, and then I would talk to them. I'm like, okay, well, what, about, what about Dickinson? Nobody really had anything to say. You know, it's kind of like, just kind of there. <laughs> you know, just kind of there. Yeah, it's like in between there somewhere <laughs> type thing. And, and you know what's interesting? I, I never could have planned it out in a million years for us to end up in this school, let alone, you know, being connected in the city of Dickinson. But there's no doubt in my mind that God wants to do something great in Dickinson. There's no doubt in my mind that God has put this church here to, to help however we can, to help the city, to bless the city. To help, to help the city however God is leading and calling us. And if you've got your notes today, as we begin to take notes, our main point's a little bit of a different one, but, but it's this, very simply. God wants to do something great in Dickinson. God wants to do something great in Dickinson. I don't believe it's just exclusive to Dickinson, but I believe God wants to do something great in the city. It's interesting, too, because even when we say that, you know, again, looking at some, some, some of your guys' faces, you kind of just smile because you're like, oh, little Dickinson. You know, it's, it's just a cute little city, you know. That's Dickinson. But I believe God wants to do something great. You know, Israel, a lot of people kind of think the same way towards Israel. 
And yet, it's the very nation that God chose to, to, to use. It's the very nation that God works through. So as we go, as we go through this, I want to share with you today, based on the story of Gideon, three ways that I believe we can make a difference in this city. And the first way is this, if you're taking notes. The same way God was working through Gideon, God encourages us to think greater about what we are capable of. Whenever God wants to do something great in a city, he, he, he wants to give us a future picture. We're not quite there yet, but this is what we could be. This is what we could do. It's interesting because, and I have your scripture in your notes, but verse 12, isn't it interesting <laughs> that God calls Gideon? He says, you brave and mighty man. That doesn't make sense, right? Gideon was a win. Think about it. Do, do, you, do you know somebody who's a win? Who comes to your mind when I say that? Hopefully not your spouse, all right? <laughs> that was Gideon. That yeah, Tom Brady, hey man. No, I'm just no, no, just joking. Patriot haters, they're all around us. When you think of when you think of the word whim, honestly, that was Gideon. And yet it doesn't make sense because God says to Gideon, you're a brave and mighty man, depending on the translation. It, Gideon was a brave and mighty. But you know what? God doesn't see us for how we actually are right now. He sees us who we're going to become. He sees, in other words, what we're capable of. You know, the scripture actually says this. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now to him who's able to do immeasurably more than what we ask or imagine, according to the power at work within us. God is able to do immeasurably more in us and through us, more than we realize. Do you realize what you're actually capable of because God is on your side? Gideon didn't. God has a great, great thing that he wants to do in you and through you. But we have to realize that we are capable of more than we even know. There's a great example of this. Uh, th this happened probably about uh, eight, eight years ago or so. Uh, there, was a, uh, there was a gal named Lauren Kornacki. And uh, she had just kind of finished up with college. And she was coming home, visiting her dad. Her dad's kind of one of those guys who likes to work on cars. And he was under the car. But when she went and saw him, she was he was actually wincing for air because the car had actually fallen on him. One of the jack stands had tipped off. And when she saw him, she couldn't think about anything else other than I have to help my dad. And in this moment, she literally took the car that was just kind of off tilted and pushed the whole car over so her dad could get so her dad could come over. This is this is documented and everything. When I was looking at that, I'm like, first of all, I want to meet this chick. Like that's amazing, all right? That is crazy. But on a bigger scale, like it's interesting because if we were to ask Lauren, Lauren, could you move a car over? My guess is Lauren would probably say, No way. <laughs> no way. But yet in that moment, because because she believed so much, she had such conviction that this situation and her dad being pressed and literally fighting for his life shouldn't happen. She was able to do something that she, in the natural, wasn't capable of. Do you realize what God can do through you? Anytime God wants to do something, he's looking for people to volunteer. He's not looking for people that are ready. He's not always looking for people that have it all figured out. He's looking for people that are willing to be a part of what he wants to do. And he begins to speak to people. He says, hey, I'm going to show you what you can be. You may have come in here today and you may have said to yourself, Brandon, I'm just, I'm just happy I'm in here. And God looks at you and says, I'm happy you're in here, but I've got way bigger plans for you than you even realize. God wants to do something incredible through you. It wasn't just Gideon. Gideon, I love this story because Gideon wasn't just this like macho, tough guy, you know, to where we'd expect, oh yeah, choose Gideon. Gideon was the wimp. He was the scared one. He's the one that would never volunteer. And yet God says, you great and mighty man. He must have freaked him out. What are you talking about? There's somebody else. This is not me. God wants to do something great through you. God sees what you are capable of. And what you're capable of are great things. Because you have a great God behind you. Here's the second thing that we learn. Not only... Not only do we need to start thinking greater about what we're capable of, 
But God wants to utilize the great traits that we already have. You already have great things inside of you. They're already there. They may be dormant. They may not be used. You may not even be aware of them. But God put great things inside of you. Because God only makes greatness. I love uh, what verse 14 says. It says this. He told him, go with your great strength. With your great strength. The context of, of it is, is this. That Gideon had strength. He wasn't a great and mighty man, there's no question, but he had strength. And what God was telling him was, you've got something right now. You've got something. I've given you something. You have some talent. You have some ability. You've got something. I gave it to you. So go use it. If we're going to do something great for God, you know what we have to do? We have to use what he's already given us. The question for us is, what has he given us? You know, I, I think about it like this with a, with a little illustration. They say sometimes that we're not able to always clearly identify the strengths inside of us without someone else. In other words, it usually takes someone else to draw those things out for us to be able to see. And um, you, may, you may have uh, seen when you came in here, but oftentimes there are things in our path and in our life that are hidden in plain sight. I'll give me an example of this. Uh, how many of you, when you came in, you saw this box right over here? Anybody? Not very many of you. And this box represents the resources that God has given us. You know, do you know that God has given you resources? Sometimes we don't think about it like that. Sometimes we think, well, Brandon, what do you mean by resources? Money? I don't have any money. I can't, you know, I can't. But you may be surprised. God may have given you something that you may have never thought of before. If you were here a couple, uh, a, a, few, uh, a few weeks ago, I shared the story of, uh, of, of a realtor that I talked to. And if, if you didn't get to hear the story, long story short, there was, a, there was a person who had the resources of land who felt led by God to just give it to a church. And this, and, and this group of people who are struggling finding a place to meet got a church overnight. That's resources. You may say, well, Brandon, that's crazy. You know, I don't have any land. You may be surprised, though. The real question is, what do you have? What has God put in your path to be utilized for the kingdom of God? You know, Gideon, at first, he didn't see anything. Oh, I can't do anything. But God said, you actually have strength. You do have something. What has God put in your path right now? What has he given you? I talk to people all the time. Oh, well, I forgot about that. I had, you know, I, I, I've, I, I actually know somebody that actually has resources. You know, uh, Jason and I, when we, were, when we were first starting this church, I didn't really have many resources down here. But I, I knew someone that had resources. And that's how we actually got that truck that we are able to do our, you know, everything that we do for services with. You may be surprised. God has put resources all around us. And sometimes we just don't think about it like that. Sometimes we're honestly, we're just not thinking enough about doing something great for God. But God has put resources in our lives. Here's another one that you, uh, that you may have not seen that's hidden in plain sight, especially for these people over here. It's knowledge. God may have actually put something in your mind that you've never even thought about it like that. When it comes to doing something great for God, you may actually know somebody. Who knows? You may know somebody in that, 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 goes to, that goes to this school that may live around the Dickinson area. Somebody that could actually help us as a church contribute back to the city. Oftentimes we downplay our knowledge, and yet it's the very thing that God will use to help us do something great for God. Here's another thing in, 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 in plain sight that was right over here that sometimes we undermine and we forget. It's skills. Sometimes we forget that God uses our skills. He uses our skill sets. And sometimes we think, well, I, I don't know, I don't really have anything. And that's kind of, the honestly, the Gideon attitude. And yet, God looks and says, you do. You do have skills. I've given you skills. Use them to do something great. The question I throw to you is very simple. What has God given you so you can do something great for God? What has God given you so you can help be a part of what we're called to do as a church and to bless the city of Dickinson? Do you, do you know somebody? Do you have a skill set? Do you, do you have a resource that maybe you've never thought of? You know, for us as a church, guys, this is what we are, this is what we're called to do. We're called to give back to our community. We're called to help this community. 
You know, when I was praying about this, I was saying, Lord, use us to help make this city great. Use us, God, to, to, to affect every single person that's in this great city. When I was praying, um, I, I, this is probably a month ago or so, the two words that, that the Lord spoke to my heart were very simply this, reach Dickinson. You know, if, if, you know uh, if you know a little bit about our church's history, you know that we've, um, this last year, we did 15 different outreaches. And man, everything you could think of from giving food away to um, renting a movie theater out. I mean, all kinds of levels and different things. And we did them all over. <laughs> did them all over League City and Texas City and Dickinson all over. And the Lord spoke to my heart this, this, this last uh, year, technically. He said, Hone in on Dickinson. And, I, and it's with that heart that I'll throw out, you know, with all of us as a church. You know what the beauty of this is? It's not just all on me. It's on us as a church. Because God hasn't just put all the, the talent, the skills, and he hasn't given me all the knowledge and the resources. You know what he's done? He's done it. He's given it to all of us. So the question I throw out is, what's the Lord speaking to you? What has he given you so you can be a blessing to the city with as, I, as, as we get ready to, to go into 2020, moving as fast as we can, what is, he, what is he speaking to your heart today? What maybe is he telling you? What resource, what skill set? What is he speaking to you? And here's the last thing that we see through Gideon. God, he's not going to have us do it on our own. God is going to help us accomplish something great. This year, guys, God wants to do something great through us. He's not going to force it. Okay, guys, good luck. He's going to do it with us. I love what the scripture says in verse 16. You can do it, Gideon. Why? Because I'm going to help you. Because I'm going to help you. You may have had challenges this, this last year. And you're saying, man, Brandon, at work, I just don't know. And I encourage you, pick up your faith. I love this. God says it to Gideon. I believe he's saying it to us. You can do that because I can help you. I believe as he's called us as a church to make a difference in the city. He's saying, yep, you guys can do that. You can do that as a church. Why? Because I'm going to help you. Do you know how powerful it is when you have God's help? <laughs> do you know that there's nothing that, that can stop you when you have God's help? There is nothing that can shut us down. I love uh, Psalm 54. It says this, that God is my helper. The Lord is the provider for my life. Psalm 121 says this. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. We've got a good God. And God's saying, hey, I want to do something great in Dickinson. Our church, let's do this together. I've given you stuff. I'm going to help you. Start seeing us as a church. We're capable of some great things. We're capable of giving back. We're capable of blessing and doing great things as a church. Now, with a message like this, oftentimes there's either maybe one centralized, okay, we're going to do this. But can I share with you today? I don't, there is nothing specific right now. There's some things I'm praying about. There's nothing specific that comes to my mind. But as I was praying about this, I felt like the real application for us is, what does that look like for you? Very open-ended. What's God telling you to do? If we're going to reach this city, and we're going to make an impact in this city, and we're going to bless the city of Dickinson, and we're going to help the great things that God wants to do happen in Dickinson. What does that mean for you? Think about it like this. If every one of us were to take that on and say, God, what would you have me do? Think about what God could do in us. What would you have me do, Lord? What does that look like? What's my part? What do I, what do I need to do? I, do, I, do, I, do, I need to do I need to utilize my skill set better? I know some people... You know, do you need to send me an email? Do you need to, you know, let me know something? What can, what can you do? Is, is God giving you resources? You're saying, well, never thought about it like that, but maybe I could, maybe that could help. God put us here as a church, not just to be a group that just meets on every Sunday and does groups. And man, all those things are a huge part of why we do what we do. But God's called us to make a difference in this community. That's why we did 15 outreaches this year. That's why we're going to do a lot of outreaches this year. God's called us to give back. You know, I was thinking of a great example of this, and um, you, you, may, you may not be familiar with, with the term, but there's a, um, there's a huge um, center in L.A. called the, uh, the L.A. Dream Center. If you're not familiar with it, 
there was a there was a 24 year old and his dad had a dream. I think it was right around 1994, and they had this dream that in LA that they could go there and they could make this difference. They wanted to do something about it, not just a dream, but actually wanted to do something. And they had this heart for like people that were homeless, foster kids, and and, and people that needed jobs. That was kind of the nature. They want to give people food. We all know how dense and how many people are in LA. I began going around praying, and I saw this old hospital building, and I thought to myself, well, that would be perfect. How are we going to afford this? So I began to pray over and over, and they asked so many different people, hey, would you, you, know, would you buy into this vision? Would you buy into this plan? Would, you know, can we do this together? And, and literally everybody told them no. And as they were praying one day, they got a phone call. It was from a financial group connected to a, a denomination. And the group said, hey, We've been praying about this. Lord's put this on our heart. We want to help fund your dream. We want to help fund this dream to, to, to make a difference in Los Angeles, in a dark place, in a very needy place. And months and months and months of work and everything went by. And they ended up turning this hospital into today what's arguably one of the most impactful centers in the entire United States. In fact, when I was in high school, I got the privilege to go there on a mission trip. In L.A. now... It, since that's happened, do you know what most of the, the, the stats show is that 70% of the crime has gone down since that building has been there. It's incredible. The, the, uh, the Dream Center blesses over over 2 million people a year. And, and, I, and, and, and you guys see behind me. It's incredible. But do you know where all that started? It started with a dream. It started with a dream. You know what's interesting? You know, it, it, the story may make it seem like it was... Matthew Barnett's dream, but you know whose dream I really believe it was? It was God's. Can I, can I tell you that there's no doubt in my mind, guys, that God wants to do something great in this city. And what God spoke to my heart was, Brandon, this is where the church is supposed to be. So you know what I said? Yes, Lord. You know, the question I'd simply ask you today is, what is your part in all this? You know, over the next year or so, and it's going to be shorter than that, but we're going to begin giving you updates and kind of how the Lord is leading us with everything from us believing for a building and us going out and doing different outreaches and being involved with some of our city officials and things of that nature. But today, the simple question I'd ask you is, what does God want to do in you? What's he speaking to you? And, and, and I'm just going to ask Sarah uh, to, to sing through the chorus of Good Good Father a couple times. And as she sings, I, I want us to, I want us to sing. I just want us to ask God that question. God, what, what do you want to do through me? How can I make a difference? 